Thank you so much. This is very unnerving. Uh, you know, it's like one of those things where you think you're a young chick and then you wake up and it's 25 years later that you, <laughs> but we still look cute from it. Um, uh, I am very, very happy to uh, be talking to you today in this type of setting with this type of audience because I think that um, it expands our conversation. So I look forward to your, to your to your questions and your thoughts. The other thing I wanted to indicate is I usually don't read papers, I usually talk, as you can tell I like to talk, uh, but I think that I wanted to be very concrete about my thoughts and so if you bear with me, I will read my paper. Um, the, uh, the one thing I wanted to start out with is with all the pictures of the feminist writers and thinkers, I quote in my 1889 article relating to privilege, and I left some white squares, no pun intended, uh, so you can insert your favorite uh, feminist thinkers and practitioners, because I think it's always important to remember our um, intellectual heritage. And it was very wonderful to start the conference with a history of our struggles, because I think that situates how we speak to each other now. So let me begin by stating that uh, feminism is not about gender. <clears throat> or, uh, or, or about gender only, or even about gender, but that feminism is a theory of liberation. Feminism uses gender as a fulcrum through which all political and social mo mobilization is evaluated. This is the revolutionary potential of feminism. And that is why when feminism turns to primarily theoretical critiques on what is gender or who has gender, Many times we end up in an intellectual cul-de-sac that has stalled feminism from its revolutionary potential. If we see feminism as a theory of liberation, then gender becomes the lens through which we can think about liberation for all. If one follows the fundamental precepts of feminism, it inevitably leads us to advocating for everyone and anyone that is oppressed, including men. Feminism is a multivalent view of reality that allows for the deconstruction of all oppression, including the oppression that comes from privilege. Feminism is an unstable theory that constructs while deconstructing. And by feminism, I include all feminisms, including the ones developed by women of color writers. And of course, I include practitioners who struggle on a daily basis on the effects of gender subordination as it intersects with other oppressions. It is a cacophony of voices, points of view, strategies, and theorizing. The common thread, however, is one of liberation, both at the structural and personal levels. That is why Feminism embraces the transient aspect of gender categorizations. At its core, uh, it defends all love between two human beings. And at times, feminism defends love between human beings and non-humans, as Donna Haraway's latest work indicates. She's into dogs these days. Uh, feminism is also deeply libertarian, and by this I mean that it embraces the study of everything without a priori holding judgment on what is worth focusing on from an academic standpoint. Hence, the feminist studies on pornography as liberation, cyber marriage as the erotic aspects of citizenship across um, the Americas, as in Felicity uh, Schaefer's recent book, Love and Empire, Cyber Marriage and Citizenship Across the Americas, disability study, transgender studies, biracial and multiracial identifications, and all the interstices produced by the intersections of binary categories. Feminism looks for absences as an indication of that which is hidden and therefore oppressed. My ain't, my, a uh, 1989 article uh, was simply an attempt to shed light on the interstices created in the choice of marriage partner for the purpose of procreation and the racialized aspect of that choice. The core of my argument was that the racialized choice of marriage partner resulted in the maintenance of white racial privilege that protected whiteness as, pro as property, to quote Cheryl Harris's classic article by the same name, and therefore maintain structural arrangements. Hence, when white women joined the feminist movement, the origins of the racial privilege also contributed to their subordination. In contrast, 
women of color's inability to cross the biological racial divide to produce pure white offspring gave them distance from white patriarchal privilege, affording them the psychological and spatial distance from white patriarchal oppression. Essential to my argument was the documentation of the very real structural differences between white women and women of color in the U.S. In particular, in educational achievement, income, single head of households, and children, uh, and, uh, and poverty rates. In revisiting my 1989 uh, article for this session, it became essential to examine whether these structural differences uh, between different groups of women actually disappear. So I turn now to some quick indicators uh, that show these disparities uh, still persist. So let me begin by looking at uh, women's median uh, weekly earnings by race and ethnicity and education, and these are 1220 data. If we look at their median weekly earnings by race and ethnicity and education, in 2012, the greatest income conversion was at the lowest level of education. That is, women with less than a high school diploma, regardless of race and ethnicity, pretty much made the same amount of money. And I think that these um, points uh, of convergence and divergence tells us a lot about where we can place our feminist uh, mobilization emphasis. The income disparity is the largest for different groups of women who have an advanced degree, with white women earning $668 more a month than African American women and $284 more a month than Hispanic women, which if you calculate the difference in a year, it adds up to be between $8,000 and $3,500 in comparison to women of color. The gender disparity in pay is mostly in relationship to white men, the highest income earners in our society. Women of color make close to 90% of what men in their own groups make, which again, I think tells us a lot about how we can at some level be independent of them and why we have to be nice to them. Um, whereas white women only make 78% of what, what uh, white men make. Latinas are the most disadvantaged when compared to white men, making only 53% of what white men earn. Another point that I made in my article is that most statistics are still uh, only shown as uh, women and men, and they hide these very dramatic differences. There is a big difference between making 78% of what white men make versus 53%. Regardless of these income disparities, all women are considerably better off than they were in 1989, and I attribute that 100% to feminism. I don't know what you guys do, but... Uh, and the same is true for education, dropout rates, and poverty rates. The disparities among different groups of women, however, persist in which white women and white men still have the highest levels of education, the lowest dropout rates, and fewer single heads of household, and the lowest poverty rates. So far, white patriarchy is alive and well. In some, some, in some aspects of structural disadvantage for women of color have remained the same, and in some areas they have gotten better. For white women, feminism has reaped enormous structural benefits. It's illustri illustrated in the gender integration in all graduate programs, except in some STEM fields and in most professions, including the powerful ones like law, medicine, and to a certain extent, academia, again, some exceptions in the STEM fields. One of the areas where there has been the most change since uh, 1989 is in the rate of intermarriage for all ethnic and racial groups in the United States. <clears throat> About 15% of all new marriages in the United States in 20. 10 were between spouses of a different race or ethnicity and more than double uh, than they were in 1980, which was about 6.7 percent. Among all newlyweds in 2010, 9 percent of whites, 17 percent of blacks, and 26 percent of Hispanics, and 28 percent of Asians married out. Looking at all married couples in 2010, regardless of when they married, the share of intermarriages reached an all-time high of 8.4%, and that's almost triple of 1980, which was 3.2%. We can still discuss how less than 10% of all marriages are intermarried, but which is still an issue, uh, but, and also there are some patterns that I think are important to discuss. 
about 24% of all black male newlyweds in 2010 married outside their race, compared with 9% of black female newlyweds, which was one of my points in 1989. Among Asians, the gender pattern runs the other way, with 36% of Asian females uh, marrying outside their race, compared with only 17% of Asian male newlyweds. Intermarriage rates among white and Hispanic newlyweds do not vary by gender. One could argue that the increasing rates of intermarriage could in fact be a measure of women of colors partaking in white patriarchal privilege, and perhaps that's somewhat true, at least in my household. Um, my husband's Irish, um, although I dominate him. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I also want to argue that the policing of white femininity has intensified as the changing demographics have increased the number of people of color, particularly Latinos, with the consequence that whites are slowly becoming um, a uh, slowly becoming a majority minority. And I, I just noticed that the, the wrong um, PowerPoint is out, so I'll talk you through the co next couple of slides. Um, in 1960, 85% of the population in the U.S. was white. In 2005, 67%. And in 2050, it'll be projected that it, only 47% of the U.S. population will be white. And the largest... Uh, uh, per, the largest group of color will be Latinos with 29%, followed by African Americans, 13%, and Asians, 9%. Um, and so, uh, is, is this, is this is happening, uh, one would say <clears throat> that, uh, that, we, that things are changing. Um, so it's a case in point of policing of white femininity is the visual representation of the Obamas, including their girls. Uh, one could argue that the hegemonic nuclear family has been colorized by the installing of a black family in the White House, no pun intended. Um, that the election of President Obama twice was the beginning of a post-racial society. However, the reality of how President Obama and his family have been treated by large segments of the population, mostly by white men who voted for him in record low numbers, has put this fantasy to rest. Um, I'm going to show you a series of slides uh, that are kind of disturbing, so you might want to look away if you don't want to um, sort of pollute your visual field. So uh, one of the main reasons is for this um, lack of post-racial society is the very ingrained uh, view that uh, we associate people of color with being subhuman, even if that person has been elected president. For example, in January 2010, the first image that came out when the name Michelle Obama was Googled was her photo morphed into an ape. Although Mrs. Obama has cultivated an image of visual conservatism through the use of an elegant wardrobe and even using pearls as a social signifier of acceptability, um, imagine the first lady's surprise when she was attacked as inappropriate for choosing a black dress, white pearls, and straightened hair as her official portrait. The critique was about her well-toned arms, which were not very feminine, and were highlighted by her sleeveless dress. In addition, her eyebrows had been criticized as being too harsh and making her look like an angry woman. Uh, her hair has been criticized because um, it's too stiff or too conventional or she doesn't go natural, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the oh, and her derriere has always uh, has been compared to J-Lo's. There you go. Um, and so that these kinds of, uh, making her very, nothing more than her, than her corpus, than her body, is something that is uh, part of the racialization process and part of guarding and policing those uh, boundaries of white femininity. Uh, similarly, in uh, 2008, uh, Malia and Sasha's likenesses were made into dolls without the first latest of the first family's consent. Many in social media felt that the Malia and Sasha dolls were an implicit reference to Gollywog dolls. 
the Galiwal was a black character in children's books in the late 19th century, usually depicted as a type of rag doll, and it was reproduced in the 1970s and, ha and had great popularity in Europe and Australia. And the doll is characterized by black skin, eyes rimmed in white, uh, thick lips, and frizzy hair. Then um, on March 23rd, uh, a mainstream Belgian newspaper published pictures of President Obama and the First Lady Michelle Obama is depicted as apes, just days ahead of Obama's expected visit to that country. Then on March 26th, uh, 2014, just a week or so ago, former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld commented that a trained ape could have done a better job securing diplomatic relations with Afghanistan than the Obama administration. These are not isolated incidents or a rare trope. Instead, these portrayals represent an underlying ambivalence about the threats to white patriarchal privilege and the contamination of white femininity, which was the core of my argument in 1989. I am sad to say that that's still alive and well, even with a black president. So where does that leave us? I think much of what I proposed in 1989 is still true and some very important, and there are some very important differences and this is what I want you to listen to, not the ugly pictures you just saw. The increasing ranks of white women in all professions, their increased visibility in heading Fortune 500 companies, their increasing role in government with a potential Hillary Rodham Clinton presidency in 2016, these have been our victories. Victories that the feminisms we built, not they built. We built these together and we have accomplished them. But we are still a long ways from what I wrote at the end of my book <clears throat> in 1986, uh, The Color of Privilege, where I stated that the goal of feminism was to, quote, conceive of and construct a world in which race, sexual orientation and gender will not matter and in which we will not know the meaning of class. Thank you so much.